Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning's Old Testament lesson from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Uh, the Lord is talking to the people that come to the temple uh, to make their sacrifices. And he is telling them that it is necessary for you to amend your ways and your doings. And let me dwell with you uh, in this place. Do not trust in the deceptive words, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. We were going to translate that kind of into colloquial language for today. We would want to say that it's not good enough to say, I go to church, I go to church, I go to church. <laughs> we have a pluralistic society that we live in in the United States. Uh, we have all kinds of people uh, of all different kinds of religions. And we have one large group that's growing in our country that are called the nuns. They have none. They have no religion. Uh, they claim do. It's just, it's not recognized religion. It can be all kinds of things. Hedonism, love of possessions, all kinds of things like that. But officially, when they go into the hospital and they say, what do you, what religion are you? They, they write, none. None. Then we know people who say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. This can be all the way from people who do read their Bible to people who go to the special the New Age stores and buy crystals. Uh, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Um, this is kind of like the woman who came to uh, St. Michael's to uh, when we had our uh, garage sale, and Kevin was uh, was uh, serving uh, drinks, coffee drinks, uh, and uh, she walked in and she said, "Oh, it's just absolutely beautiful church. I'm looking for a church." Uh, she said, "Maybe this is." It, it, I'm looking for a church that will let me believe what I want to do. Believe what I want to believe and do what I want to do. I said, this isn't for you. This is not a do-your-own-thing community. Then there are people who are religious, but they're not spiritual. Uh, these are the people who do things like they, these are the ones who say, well, I go to church. I know exactly where to do everything. I cross myself exactly at the right place. I never miss any of the big days. Uh, when was the last time you read your Bible? Bible? Oh, that oh that thing we read at church. Yeah. No, I don't read the Bible. You know. Or when was the last time you prayed? I don't pray. I go to church every Sunday. We have that group of people that we call C and Ears, Christmas and Easter. You know, I always found it interesting in my former life because things changed. You know, there was the Episcopal Church began to be kind of the church of what's happening now. And so people that hadn't been since Christmas, we had a new book. They were totally lost. They didn't know what was going on. You know. Then we have people, they are religious, they would put down I'm something, whatever, but you know, but their only exposure to church is weddings and funerals. Uh, that's, that's, when, that's how much they, they participate. Then we have some people who say uh, that, it's, that religion is a family thing. And so it's really important that, um, that my family come to church. We always go to church on Christmas. It's a family thing, and then we go home and we have a dinner and stuff. We had people who were very interested in becoming members of St. Michael's, but the thing that held them back is that they didn't like the idea that when they came to church at Christmas, that their non Orthodox children or non Orthodox extended family members could not receive communion. So we're not going to get into that religion. Or as one person said to me, I really, I really 
appreciate what you're doing trying to start this church and everything else like that, but orthodoxy is just too darn religious. <laughs> No, not quite. I cleaned it up a little bit. Um, then there are people that are very religious, but they're also, that means they, they go to church uh, a lot, uh, but they're very sinful. Uh, it doesn't translate into the way they live their lives. They compartmentalize their life. They, this is my church life, this is where I do this, and then out there I do what I want. I, I like the little statement uh, that was said, I don't know, I can't remember who it was that said it, but about the Church of England. Uh, this person was asked, why are you a member of the Church of England? He said, I love Anglicanism. It doesn't interfere with my religion or my politics. Then there are people who make up their own religion. I know somebody like this recently that has actually created their own little religion. Then there's a large group of people, many of them even e would identify as evangelicals, that say, I'm Christian, but I never go to church, but I read my Bible at home. That, that, there's, there's that. And, and there's probably a host of other possibilities. Um, so the issue that I want to think with you uh, today uh, to think about is what are the components of an authentic uh, religious quest uh, on the part of a person? What, what, what comprises this thing that we call religion and all that? Um, so I, I wrote some definitions. I made them up. I didn't look them up in Merriam-Webster. I, I made these definitions up myself. The first one, what is a religion? You know, what is a religion? Well, it's a specific set of organized beliefs and practices that are shared by a community or a group. That's a religion. And we have all kinds of religions in America, in the world today. You know, we have Jews, we have Christians of all different varieties. We have uh, Muslims, we have Buddhists, Hindus. You name it, it's been thought up by somebody. So that's a religion. We also have people who have religions that aren't recognized as religions. Uh, people who worship money, property, position, power. Uh, sports. You name it. You can make anything a religion. In the Soviet Union, they didn't give up, they didn't give up religion, they gave up orthodoxy. And communism became the religion. It was a religion. That's, it functioned that way. It had a set of beliefs, practices, that was shared by a group, whether they wanted to share it or not. So there are a lot of people, and we know people, that they're religious. That means they go to church once a month, four times a month, twice a year, whatever. But that's religion. There's another word, liturgy. Liturgy. When we, we talk about, we usually don't, as Orthodox, we don't say we're going to go to church as much as we say we're going to go to liturgy. I want to go to the liturgy. Going to church could be coming to Vespers. Remember that one? The Vesper service? This one Saturdays at 4.30? Uh, or could be coming to any, any of the various services that we have, you know. But liturgy, liturgy, uh, here's my definition, ceremonial enactment of, the, of a religion's belief that is offered in worship to a supreme being. That's liturgy. It's ceremonies. People used to, I used to laugh because people used to say that the, the, the church is too, 
is too, the church is too ritualistic. And what they meant by that is that we do too much stuff. You know, we're crossing ourselves, we're kneeling, we're bowing, we're genuflecting, we're prostrating, we're standing, we're sitting, we're kneeling. You know, well, that's not ritual. That's ceremony. Ritual is the text. We are a church that has rites, and they are in the book. They are the words. The rites are the words. A ritual, a ritual book, we have books that are called the ritual. It has the words for all the different things like the sacraments, baptism, and chrismation, and marriage, and burial, and well, that's a rite. Then we have ceremonies, all the different things that we do that are, that are kind of the bodily outward manifestations. People can be absolutely adept at the liturgy. I, I remember I had a guy whose name was Warren uh, in, in seminary, and every he was at my table for one year. It was like purgatory. <laughs> you know? uh, after every uh, Tuesday uh, liturgy, we had a community liturgy for the whole entire seminary community and we were expected to be there but afterwards we'd sit at, the t at our dining table where we were assigned and, and we had Warren there and Warren would do a, a blow by blow critique of the how well the celebrant the priest that served the, the, the Eucharist how well he did did he do it the right way did he hold it I mean he got down to the very tiniest little details he didn't have his hands at the right height, and his cross was too tiny, and he was, we kind of thought of, we thought about him, we kind of thought he was kind of like a sacristy rat. I mean, he was just into these little tiny, uh, persnicky little things that really don't mean anything. I mean, it's not going to be the end of the universe. If I'm supposed to cross something five times and I miscount and do it four, it doesn't invalidate anything. It's just I, I'm a human and I made an error, you know. We laugh. Uh, Father Basil and I, we laugh that uh, we made a mistake. We make a mistake in a service and we go back to the sacristy and we, tell, and we say, well, if anybody asks us, we'll just say, oh, that is the way it's done on the 14th Sunday of Pentecost. <laughs> and they'll, they'll believe it, you know? <laughs> then there's this uh, fuzzy thing called spirituality. Here's my definition. The individual quest for communion with that which is ultimate. That's spirituality. It's an individual, personal thing. Uh, spirituality is what I do with my religion on a personal level. You know, we have a real problem in this country. Uh, it's, it's called the Supreme Court. Sorry to tell you. And they have consistently throughout the 20th, the second half of the 20th century and now into the 21st century, they are maintaining that the uh, amendment that protects r religious rights, that it refers to only private expression of religion, not public. That's how they're interpreting it. I mean, it just you don't have to be some raving liberal. That's the way those people that are, that are conservatives are interpreting it. They are, con they are interpreting that we have complete separation of the religious world from the political and social world. And so it's okay for you to say your prayers at home, but you cannot do it at work. It's okay for you to wear a cross to the uh, restaurant, but you can't wear it to your work of employment. I mean, it's private. The government is, the, the, they, they are maintaining that the Constitution protects my right to privately uh, enact my religion. That isn't what it says at all. It's they're not going to infringe on my public right to say I am a Christian, I wear a cross, I'm going to say grace at the restaurant, whatever. 
That's guaranteed by our Constitution. But they're saying that it isn't. So in this room today, we have how many people there are. We have that many spiritualities. You, you have your spirituality, I have mine. What you do uh, in, your, in your personal quest for, a, or for union with God, that, that's your spirituality. And then the fourth word is, I, I, I want to hold up, is asceticism. Uh, this is about, you know, monks, or they are ascetics. They are spiritual athletes. That's what the word really means. They're spiritual athletes. Paul, the apostle, used all these uh, images of, about athletics, running a race, uh, shadow boxing. He used all these various uh uh, metaphors for the spiritual life, and he used uh, athletic metaphors. And so, to engage, this is my definition of asceticism, the primary means by which we enact our spirituality. That's asceticism. The primary means. What do we do to further our quest for union with God? Um, what does that look like in our life? It may be governed by some, it may be governed by some um, uh, vows that we keep to ourselves. You know, monks take the vow, monks and nuns take the vow of, of, uh, of poverty, chastity, obedience. If you're Benedictine, uh, stability. You don't, you don't move from community to community just because you didn't like the sermon. You know, go to a different church and try to find the one you like. Uh, you stay where you are and you work out your salvation in fear and trembling. And the last one is amendment of life. Continual amendment of life. The willingness to launch out and say, I'm going to be willing to change. That's, that's, that's a vow. That, that's, we, we all have our own little set of things that we try to do in our lives that are an expression of our highest values as a, as a human being. Well, these four aspects, the nature of religion, uh, the, uh, that of liturgy, uh, of spirituality, and of asceticism, and I think that for a, for a, healthy, uh, a healthy human life, I think we need all four of these. It's not good enough to just engage in one of them. We need all four. We need a set of, of how we understand the things. That's, that's our religion, how we, how we see things. And it would be nice to see things the way God sees them. So it would be important for us to, to embrace a religion that we believe has its origin, not in some made up thing, but in a revelation from, from God. Um, it's not just me and God, so liturgy is very important, the getting together, we're all in this together. You know, Elder Amphilochius, who was the abbot of the monastery on the Isle of Patmos, he said to his disciples, the, the members of his community, he said, I do not want paradise without you. Well, I, I, I want that, that's what I want. I don't want to be in paradise without all you guys. I want you there. That's why I push you so much. Because I want you to be there. But I hope I get there too. <laughs> um, a spirituality. We all have to own it for ourselves. It's not just, well, my father was a Methodist, so therefore I'm a Methodist. Or we've always been Orthodox. Or we've always been Pentecostal. You know, if everybody had that view, there wouldn't be one person here. It'd all be somewhere else, you know. So we have to own it for ourselves. We have to say, this is going to be my way of working out my salvation in fear and trembling, which is what Paul said we, we needed to do. And then asceticism, the practices that we're going to put in place to really do something, you know, to really make some progress. Now, this is the last Sunday of the season of Epiphany. So this is the kind of, we're getting ready Next week is the three, we have three weeks of, of uh, pre-Lent, the pre-Lent, 
So today, we could look at today and say, today is we're getting ready to get ready to keep Lent. That's what we're getting ready for. Getting ready. And so um, I want to encourage you to take these four, four categories and ask yourself uh, today, what am I going to do to further my spiritual life, my, my Christian walk? What am I going to do come Lent? So, so we're going to have three weeks to get ready, so you've got three weeks to think it through, and then come the beginning of Lent, what am I going to do to strengthen my embracing the Christian faith as we understand it as Orthodox Christians? What am I going to do to really participate in the liturgies of the church and be part of the community? What am I going to do about my own personal activities at home? And what am I willing to do in order to enact my spirituality, both in my home, in my office, in my community, in my, at the golf course, at the grocery store, or whatever? What am I going to do about this? The reason why I think this is an important exercise to engage in, just to reiterate, God says to Israel, amend your ways and your doings. I want you to change. That's what he's telling you. I want you to change. And let me dwell with you. It's not going to be good enough to say, I go to church, I go to church, I go to church. But truly amend your ways and your doings. And if you truly do this, today could be the first day of the rest of your life. And it could really make a difference. Amen. Amen. Thank you.